So here's something that you don't see too often in nat nature, a concentrated pile of seed. There's a reason for that. Seed likes to spread out, to go solo, to travel, dispersal by wind, water, fur. Seed likes to wander, to adventure, to find that unsprouted space, a place to experiment with the next generation. So it should come to us as no surprise that we can now find lettuce seeds in space. In 2015, NASA announced that the astronauts of Expedition 44 of the International Space Station would be, for the very first time, sampling a red romaine lettuce that they'd grown from seed in space, the fruition of a NASA program called VEG01. That lettuce variety, called Outregis, was bred on an organic farm in Oregon by an organic farmer and chosen by scientists at NASA and the University of Wisconsin to be the first crop in space, along with a handful of other crops that that same farmer bred on that same organic farm in Oregon. Now, don't get too nervous. I know we're here to talk about Earth optimism, not Mars, and I'm not about to give an urgent plea that we should start breeding potatoes for soil inoculated with Matt Damon's gut biome. Uh, while I'm continuing to, well, I, I continue to look for you know, some, some optimism in space work and for the humans and the animals and plants that we might choose to go out into space with us, I'm not really ready to give up on the beautiful diversity of life we have here on planet Earth. So what about seeds on Earth? What are we doing with our seeds on planet Earth? And how can our relationship to seeds offer solutions for people and planet? This is one of the things that we're doing here on planet Earth with seed. This slide shows concentration, consolidation, acquisitions in the global seed market from 2003 to 2013. Agricultural crop genetics, a natural resource, resource for which we did not allow patenting prior to the mid-1980s, has become more concentrated than any sector in our economy. Four companies currently own 65% of our global crop genetics, Monsanto, Bayer, DuPont, and Dow. But those companies are in the midst of another round of mergers, Monsanto and Bayer, Dow and DuPont. And with those mergers, two companies will control 65% of our global field crops, and over in one company will control 25% of our global vegetable crops. Now, they say they need to merge in order to be better at solutions. So is this a solution? Let's put aside for a moment a lot of concerns about these companies. Let's put aside, actually, for a moment, if concentration in media or banking or any other sector has really resulted in a net positive good, a net public good. Let's put aside for a moment if a group of majority shareholders for agrochemical seed companies staring at quarterly returns and looking at profitability as the indicator of success are really the right people to be determining our seed and our food future. It's hard to put aside, but let's put those questions aside for a second. Is this a solution? This is not a sustainable solution for a resilient food future for all of us. Resiliency in terms of ecological sustainability, economic vitality of our rural communities, cultural integrity of our food systems requires robust diversity. Diversity not only in crops and in crop genetics, but diversity in the actors, those who are solving for seed, those who are working with seed, a diversity of stakeholders speaking up about what our food future should look like. Simply put, this is not a solution because the shareholders do not see adequate return on investment for diversified, smaller scale, low input farmers, urban gardeners who don't fall easily into a speculative agricultural commodity system. This solution already is leaving farmers, food communities, and nutritious crops underserved. At Cliff Bar, we believe that we need a diverse, decentralized public plant breeding system with independent distribution system. We've invested over $11 million in commitments to that end to date. In the face of climate chaos, challenges of food and nutrition access, uh, and diminishing and degraded natural resources, we really need more seed innovators, not more centralized seed innovation. So I want to share with you a few examples of where I see optimism 
and who I, people I call seed heroes, people I've worked with for almost 20 years now. This is Frank Morton, Frank Morton who bred out Regis lettuce. He doesn't have a PhD in crop genetics, but his seeds are sold around the world by very large seed companies, not only grown on the space station. Why? Because Frank has an interesting approach to plant breeding. He's not really breeding for space. He's breeding for a planet that's full of more and more challenges, and he's breeding for all of us. Frank's approach is an open source approach. If patents and concentration are a closed fist grasping at ownership and control and fighting against others to innovate with their crop genetics, Frank is the opposite. We've all seen that photo of a calloused, uh, soil-stained hand offering seeds. That is Frank's approach, this open sharing of his knowledge and his crop genetics with all. He trains other farmers in plant breeding. And his approach for breeding is to put his seeds through what he calls Hell's Half Acre. He has, for each of his crops, a special half acre that's ridden with disease. He inoculates it with disease that's full of weeds and pests. And he selects the seeds to be workhorses, to perform well in the harshest of environments, not just space, but the harsh environments we have with climate chaos. This is why NASA and University of Wisconsin selected his seeds, not because he's a nice, generous guy. One of the crops that Frank breeds that we've been funding for some years is quinoa. Now, we know quinoa is an Andean crop, but quinoa also can be grown here in the United States. And it's a wonderful crop to be breeding for ecological stress because it does well with high salinity so soils in extreme environments. So we started a program breeding quinoa with Frank and, the, and Washington State University. And to date, there's now thousands of acres of quinoa being produced in the state of California and commercialized by Lundberg. Lundberg, who sells rice and also sells a variety of snack products, now we're actually growing Frank's genetics in quinoa and commercializing that. Lundberg is a competitor of Cliff Bar. Cliff Bar funded all of this work. You might ask why, that doesn't make business sense. In our perspective, there's a place for businesses to compete and there's a place for businesses to cooperate. And it, when it comes to diversifying our crop genetics and offering more opportunities for farmers, the answer is simple, cooperation wins the day. This is Steve Jones. He's a professor of wheat breeding at Washington State University in a program that's called the Bread Lab. He breeds grains, not just wheats, all, a variety of grains. Steve recognizes that grains were once an intrinsic part of all farming systems in the United States. Whether you're a vegetable farmer, cotton farmer, whatever you do, you want to rotate your crops with grains because grains replenish the nutrients in the soil. They break disease cycles. They're very important from an ecological perspective in whole integrated farming systems. But in his area of Washington State, the western side, the vegetable producers in that area and the seed and tulip producers in that area stopped growing grains. Why? Because the conventional commodity system didn't want to buy their 100 or 200 acres of small grains. They didn't fit their model of growing. And yet they needed to grow grains. So Steve started breeding grains that would do well in their system, but also have economic return. He started breeding for local terroir. He started working with Dan Barber and other chefs to select varieties that had interesting flavor profiles so that local bakers would want to use these grains. He started working with local beer makers in the Seattle area to work on lo local terroir for barley malts so that they would use these crops. And to date, there's over $10 million of milling and malting and processing activity all going around the small organic breeding program at Washington State University, the Bread Lab. We fund five graduate students, PhD students in Steve's program. And one of the reasons I love his program is they don't just work in the field breeding new grain varieties, oats, barley, wheat. They actually get into the, the lab, the Bread Lab. And they work with chefs. They work with food companies like King Arthur Flour. This is actually Representative Benet from Washington State working in the lab. And they learn how their crops and the genetics in the field translate into quality traits that consumers care about. That's the kind of integrated seed solution that we're proud to be a part of funding. <coughs> now, the, these two are examples of, of people that I've worked with for many years that we fund, but there's another seed hero that I want to share a little bit about, someone who I would love to meet but have not yet had the honor. This is Mary Abokutsu Nyango. She's sometimes called the mother of indigenous vegetables in Kenya. She's standing here in a field of African solanacea nightshade in uh, Joma Kenyatta University near Kenya. She grew up eating these greens and has led efforts to study their nutritional benefits uh, and to repopularize these vegetables in Africa. This is at a time when many food aid projects are trying to get African farmers 
to grow biofortified corn, corn that's been biofortified for more uh, carotene in the, in the corn, which is good. It's a healthy, nutritious thing to have more carotene in the corn. The problem is it's a bright day glow orange corn that doesn't do well in the marketplace because it's not a part of the cultural diet of the people of her community. And so it's not used and it's not eaten. Meanwhile, their indigenous crops have been neglected. So Mary and a group of scientists, they're not just trying to reintroduce heritage varieties. They're studying these varieties, and they're breeding and improving them for disease resistance and pest resistance so that they can once again be an integrated part of a healthy and nutritious diet for the people of Kenya. Now, there's one thing that all three of these seed heroes share. They have open, cooperative, networked model of sharing. They have transparency. And they get input from all stakeholders, from consumers to farmers. All, everyone is a part of the, of the solution in the conversation. I'm inclined to feel trust and to feel optimistic about our food future if we can have more Franks and Steves and Marys. It's not that I think the big ag chemical gene giants are intrinsically evil. I have good friends who work for those companies. And they have done some solid breeding work in many crops. But the simple truth is that plant breeding is an investment in what tomorrow's agriculture and food will be. And the golden rule of success successful financial investing is diversification. Simply put, diversification. Over-investing in one, in one single area is not only risky, but it actually decreases the likelihood for successful future returns. The same investment philosophy is true in finance as it is in food. It's well past time that we reconsider how we invest in progress in problem solving when it comes to, to plant breeding and seed. Who are the decision makers? Who's invited to the table? Who are the active participants in developing our food future? When it comes to seed solutions, the success will not be measured by quarterly returns of a few mega corporations. Success will be measured by succession by how we hand off our soil, our water, our farms, our knowledge, our seed? Will we leave these resources better than when we took them on? Will they be degraded or diversified? Will we add value or not? The diversity and resiliency of life that we have here on this earth, in my opinion, was not created in a competitive system that is a zero-sum game in which there are one winner who takes all. That is not the evolutionary story that I see. That's Wall Street's interpretation of evolution, and it's a twisted interpretation. Because the beauty and the life of communities of organisms on this planet, and the way they've spread across this planet, were really created as the result of solutions that are rooted in interaction, in mutual dependence, and in sharing. So I invite you all to learn more about diverse seed systems, decentralized seed systems, and the heroic people who are working on solutions for all, and to share that knowledge with others. Thank you.